committee meeting with the education committee. Want to thank Dr. Joseph and his team and um, uh, school board members that's also here too, and of course um, the budget and finance committee and those that serving on the education committee. Um, I'm gonna turn it over. You want something to say, uh, Chair Rosenberg? <laughs> Yeah, th thank you all for coming here. Thanks to Dr. Joseph and the leadership team from Metro Schools for joining us. Um, our hope is that we can um, have a couple of these meetings over the course of the year ahead of budget season so that we can ensure that there's a good flow of information and that when budget time rolls around, the council feels well informed and equipped to, to uh, ensure that we can do what we need to do to help Metro Schools succeed for my children and yours. Dr. Joseph. We'll turn it over to you for introductions. Well, thank you, Kelly Lady Bircher and Councilman Rosenberg for the invitation to visit with you today and to discuss our capital needs for the school system and the process we use to determine and prioritize those needs. And I also want to thank all the uh, councilmen and women that were able to uh, come tonight uh, for this presentation. You know, we really appreciate your support and the mayor's support. In the past couple of years, you, you funded much needed renovations, expansions, and new construction uh, at Tusculum Elementary, Goodlettsville Middle School, MLK High School, Overton High School, and others. Uh, construction is beginning at Hillsborough High School, and we will open a new Eagle View Elementary next fall. Uh, thank you for your support uh, for all of these projects. When our school facilities and equipment are safe and up-to-date, well-designed and well-maintained, the learning environment is enhanced, and that positive learning environment can make a huge difference in academic achievement. And more than that, it makes a difference in the health, safety, and well-being of our students, families, and staff. Uh, many of our school buildings are older, and maintaining those buildings require a constant effort and substantial funding. Uh, the more preventative maintenance we can do, the longer our buildings are equipped and, and equipment will last. As you know, right now, we have about a $300 million in de deferred maintenance cost. Uh, this, topic is of, of, this topic is of the utmost importance, and we want to be sure that you're informed of the successes and challenges on the front end. Uh, we all recognize that open communications, transparent communication throughout the year will better serve our children and our community here in Metro Nashville Public Schools. MMPS is at the outset of a capital budget process this year. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to explain and discuss the process from beginning and continuing the dialogue throughout the year. Uh, MMPS and the Metro Council are partners in public education and together uh, we are partnering for a brighter future for our children. Uh, we appreciate having uh, school board chair Anna Shepard here with us along with uh, Thais Hunter who's in charge of the uh, budget uh, committee uh, this year as well as Chris Henson and we have uh, a number of our extraordinary staff uh, who are able to answer questions. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Board Chair Shepard. Thank you, Dr. Joseph, and thank you, Council Lady Bircher and Councilman Rosenberg for arranging this opportunity to discuss the capital needs process, and thank you all for being here. From the school board's perspective, I would like to um, reiterate something Dr. Joseph said. We are all on the same team, the school system, the school board, Mayor Barry, and the council. We want what's best for Nashville and what's best for our schools and the children of Nashville. We play different roles, but we all have the same goals. And we better serve our community when we have open dialogue with each other. We are committed to continuing that open dialogue and improved communication with you, whether it's in a formal committee meeting like this or informally. When you have a question or a concern, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us to ask that question. Thank you again for the opportunity to meet with you. I'm honored to turn the presentation over to our Chief Operations Officer, Chris Henson. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Board Chair Shepard. And I'll also acknowledge uh, Board Member Christian Bugs, who just got here. Thank you for being here. Uh, we've placed a, a, a few documents in front of you. Um, as uh, Dr. Joseph indicated, we are just embarking at the beginning stages of our capital needs process for the 2018-19 year. Um, you may or may not know that our school board does have a capital needs committee that meets uh, throughout the fall into the winter and makes a recommendation regarding the six-year capital improvement budget request uh, that would be submitted to the Metro Planning Department uh, by the end of January. 
And so we have not yet begun formally uh, discussing what our capital improvement budget request will look like for 2018-19, even though we have had some internal discussions. And so we did want to include some information in front of you as it relates to just some facts about the school district and as it relates to buildings, square footage, et cetera, as well as on the right-hand side what our process is that we use in determining what our priorities are. Uh, we have a, a fairly sophisticated process to uh, basically determine the facility condition uh, score of each of our buildings. That is something that uh, on a five-year basis is uh, verified by an independent consultant, MGT of America. Uh, we uh, go ahead and update those facility condition scores throughout the year if we do for instance, some major projects at a school where we replace an HVAC system or some major work, we will make those changes between the, the five years. Um, so what we look at is the facility condition score of each of our facilities, and the prioritization is that the lower the score, the higher the priority. Likewise, we look at what's called building utilization, which is basically uh, looking at the school's program capacity and looking at the number of students enrolled at the school. If it's at 100%, that means that the school is uh, full. If it's over 100% utilization, obviously that means the school is overcrowded. And we would be looking potentially at either adding classrooms to that school or even potentially building a new school if needed. And so those are the, the ways that we uh, begin the process of looking at determining what our priorities are. Then we try to arrange those throughout that six-year required capital improvement budget request based upon those priorities, trying to sort of even those out uh, over the, those six years. Um, as Dr. Uh, Joseph indicated, we do have a, a serious backlog of deferred maintenance, uh, as he said, around $300 million. We do have a, a lot of old buildings, a lot of old schools that do require a lot of uh, upkeep. and so. Uh, that is just as important as any new schools that we might build or any major renovation projects that we might have. That, uh, that deferred maintenance as well as some other things that are included in our district-wide request, which would be technology, IT, as well as uh, replacement of school buses. Those are all included in our district-wide priorities and are, again, just as important as those major projects uh, that we have uh, on the construction side. So, wanted to just uh, briefly, in a nutshell, give you some information as it relates to what our process is. And as I said, we, we don't have anything to share at this point regarding what the 1819 request will be because that will ultimately be voted upon by the Board of Education. Uh, and so I believe we're here to share information and to hopefully answer any questions that you may have regarding our process and regarding where we are with any project that we may have. Thank you, Mr. Hens. Um, I will go ahead and just, just jump right in. Um, cost overruns, and I know this is a little different from the capital needs uh, request, but cost overruns, what measures are in place um, to ensure that um, those costs don't exceed um, what's been budgeted for, uh, particularly the, the Hillsborough project, which I believe um, is $10 million over budget? Sure, and, and I think we all understand all of the construction that's taking place in Nashville uh, where uh, there's so much construction going on, uh, it's, it becomes very difficult to estimate what the future cost is going to be when the capital budget request is made. Uh, there can typically be anywhere from a two to three year lag time between when the capital budget request is made and then after uh, all of the design, et cetera, and the bids are put out for the, for the project, uh, that can be quite a bit of time and a lot can change over that time period. And so we have seen uh, significant escalation in construction costs. And so we, in future projects, we are applying a higher uh, escalation percentage uh, as it relates to what we are requesting, realizing that the actual bids would not come in and be opened for an extended period of time, particularly if it's a major project. And so we're, uh, just like most everyone else, uh, trying to uh, get our arms around what that uh, escalation is. Uh, what we've seen from some of our contractors is they, uh, they are putting a number out there, uh, regardless of how high it might be, because they realize that even if they don't get that, uh, that project, they still have more than uh, enough work. 
And so it's been something that I think uh, us, as well as uh, Metro General Government, as well as the private sector, has been dealing with in the, uh, the climate that we have in Nashville. Councilman Cooper. Um, thank you, um, Chairman Men and Chair Lady. And thank you, Director and Chris and Anna, all for being here. I'm, I'm very grateful. A couple of quick questions. One on the handout on lead uh, testing uh, in the water system. Um, it may I may show that my high school statistics were not what they should have been. But it says three phases of testing, 30 locations per school or more than 4,200 samples. Is this telling me that you sampled every water dispenser? Or, you, I mean, it's inherently saying that you just took a subsection and tested um, sort of r random water. So is this out of a possible 4,200 locations or this is this 4,200 samples? We had multiple phases of okay. this project that actually began in, in the summer of 2016 where we voluntarily embarked on water sampling, water quality sampling. There was no state, uh, local, or federal requirement to do so. Initially, what we wanted to do was to look at our oldest 49 buildings, and we were looking at every single um, location in a building where water would come into that building. And so on average, that was of almost 60 locations per building. Then once we got those results back and had those results analyzed by our consultant, uh, we decided, Dr. Joseph decided, that we wanted to make sure that we tested every single water fountain or, or water dispenser that would, where uh, students and staff would, would possibly drink for every single school. And so we did that this past summer, uh, and I've got the results if we want to go into the detail there. Uh, but obviously that reduced somewhat the sample, the number of samples per location because we weren't looking at every custodial sink and, and those kinds of things. We were looking at water fountains, water bubblers, faucets, et cetera, uh, so that we could make sure that any exceeded the EPA recommended 15 parts per billion that they were disconnected until uh, they were mitigated. And so there, there's a little confusion since we had the two phases, but that's basically the process we followed. Okay, so thank you. So people can be reassured that any place that you could be receiving lead from the water, it has been tested. It has been tested and, and it has Wonderful. been uh, disconnected and or mitigated. Wonderful. And we will continue with that random sampling uh, into the future uh, so that we can make sure that any that may have tested close to 15, we're going to continue testing those uh, so that uh, we can uh, apply uh, whatever measures we need to apply to make sure that, that they're safe. Thank you. Another question, if you don't mind, I don't want to uh, take too much, is the projected enrollment decline for the school system this year. I know this has been something that um, the board has been looking into. Um, one, just to confirm that that trend is held up some months later of a very small decrease in overall enrollment. And then secondly, have, have you developed a sort of an explanation, sort of a, a reason behind it? Are there fewer kids in the county? Has gentrification displaced families or people opting out of the school system, either public or charter system? Um, is there, a, because I think a lot of policy and spending follows that statistic, um, has there, is there a rationale that the school board believes is correct? Yeah, we have obviously looked at that closely, and um, as you said, we had a, a slight decrease of approximately 800 students from the prior year out of 86,000 students. Uh, that was not projected. We were projecting a, a basically a slight increase. Uh, what we looked at was we were seeing the reduction mainly occurring at the elementary level. We also looked at uh, a reduction in our English learners. And we don't know if that's due to the, the current political climate and rhetoric that has been occurring as it relates to undocumented uh, families and students, but we have seen uh, somewhat of a decrease in the number of English learner students. Uh, as you said, we are seeing gentrification occurring where uh, we have uh, how households that now are being occupied by millenni millennials that may not have children or do not have children. And so there are a number of factors uh, that go into, from what we've been able to gather at this point, that go into uh, that, that slight reduction. 
Okay. But there's not, I mean, it would seem as a somewhat knowable fact or uh, explanation. Are there just um, English learners, are there fewer immigrant children in effect? Or are there fewer children, or are there fewer four-year-olds? Or are there as many four-year-olds who are just not coming into the school system? I mean, that, I mean, because we can count the four-year-olds, and then we know if we capture them. Is there any, again, I think it's worth having a kind of formally accepted explanation for this. Sure. Why don't you let us, if we could, put something in writing uh, okay. so that we can, I can make sure that I cover everything. Thank you. Uh, and we can provide well, that to you. Please, because if that trend were to continue, I think it would reshape the construction budget and you would want to shift new construction money over to maintenance, for example. Um, and of course, with a county as large as ours, what we're seeing is uh, continued growth, uh, significant growth in the southern and southeastern part of the county with enrollment losses in the, the northern and northeastern part of the county. And so we're still seeing growth in, in parts of the county where we're going to need to continue to add classrooms and build schools. And what we're, what we're trying to do is to, uh, to make sure that we also look at the areas where we're seeing decreased uh, enrollment. And it obviously is not something that where we can uh, bus students from Antioch to White's Creek uh, because of the, the distance. And so we're not going to be able to rezone our way out of it, but we that's part of our MNPS next, as you know, uh, looking at uh, building utilization and how we can be more okay. as efficient as possible. Grateful. And one last quick question. Number of portables, thank you for the information, 316. Is there an aging of the portables? Is there a 316 whose average age of how many years? We can provide that. Okay. And I'll, I'll also say that's the grand total number of portables. The number of portables that are actually used as classrooms is uh, less than 200. Uh, okay. So a lot of schools like to have portables for things such as storage or the PTO or after school programs and things of that nature that aren't necessarily used as classrooms. And so we have the exact number that are also used as classrooms, uh, which is a much lower number. Well, if you, and if you would provide the aging, that would be super because a portable that's there for too many years is not really a portable, it's just a badly built permanent school building. So Correct. with that, thank you, Chair People. Uh, and I'll say that our, uh, our intent for a number of years has been to reduce and hopefully get rid of portables. Uh, we don't like them. Uh, we would much rather be able to add classrooms or build new schools so that students and staff do not uh, have class in a portable. So the cost of a seat in a portable would be about what? As opposed to nope. the cost of a seat in an actual building? Wouldn't have that off the top of my head. Okay. Not sure because it has seemed like in an actual building that can run fifty or sixty thousand dollars a seat based on new construction buildings divided by the projected number of students, and I just didn't know whether that what that was for portables. Don't, don't that also that. would be super. Thank you. Grateful to you all three for being there. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Kendall. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. Um, got a couple of questions. One relates uh, somewhat with what uh, Councilman Cooper just just asked, and but uh, well, let me ask the other one first. The in I guess about uh, two thousand ten or somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, the school board had a policy to reserve you know schools that were closed uh, for whatever reason. We reserved some of those schools and kept them in the inventory to be used in case of renovations and uh, the need for for um, uh, an immediate emergency need, for example. Uh, we're still doing that. We currently, the only uh, current unoccupied building that we have that's unoccupied by us uh, would be uh, the Stokes building. Uh, a number of our uh, older buildings that uh, that we had we had considered surplusing we are now leasing to charter schools and so the only building that's not being used as a school that it, that's owned by MNPS at this point would be the Stokes building and it's being partially leased by Lipscomb University so we don't have uh, we don't have vacant facilities around that could be used like you're saying and, and of course I remember us doing this where we could move an, an entire school to a vacant building while we renovated that school for instance 
Uh, we, we no longer have that, and so what we're having to do is to renovate while students and staff are still in the school. It takes the project longer. Uh, the students and staff don't have to relocate, uh, but we no longer have those, those types of facilities that, that, are, that are vacant. Was that because of the, I, I know the, one of the reasons that we passed that policy was that was such a demand from the charter school people to take over some of the schools or lease them or whatever, and, and that was one of the reasons that we decided to at least reserve two or three buildings, elementary, maybe one that could uh, accommodate middle school, et cetera. But what would happen if, even if it were emergency, you had to close the school down, fire, whatever, for four or five months, where would those kids go? Just scatter them around? Or how would you handle that? We'd probably need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, depending upon the location of the school and, and the building itself and the size of the enrollment. Uh, but we don't have we don't have a spot where we could easily move an entire school into another facility at this point. This may be a, not a good question. Do you think you need that? It's been helpful in the past, uh, as you know, as you remember as a school board member, right. it's been helpful to have those facilities, even though typically they were much smaller facilities and older facilities. Uh, uh, not everybody liked being relocated to an older, smaller facility where you had to surround it with portables. Uh, but that at least allowed us to move much quicker as far as a renovation project, for instance, goes. We could move much quicker uh, and, and not have to do it in phases like we're doing now. So you, you believe it was a cost saving? I think I'm hearing that. Uh, maybe. I maybe. don't know about the cost. I do know that it would be a definitely a time saving uh, because now with the phasing, it does take longer. But again, not everyone was thrilled with moving into a smaller, older building either. But it did allow us, a, it gave us a lot more flexibility. I have one, one more question, and it kind of relates to student uh, <coughs> population. But I, I know you stated that in the north, northern section of the county you had reductions. But in the district that I represent now, uh, around West End or going over to it and, and the Costos district as well, uh, there's a lot of building going on, going on apartments with houses and condos, et cetera. Now, a lot of them are being occupied by millennials who don't have children, but uh, I think what we will probably see in the next few years is a lot more kids, especially a lot more diverse population in those, uh, in those areas. Uh, and I know, for example, the Buena Vista School don't sits on about four acres pretty small, I don't know how many acres exactly, but somewhere like that. Uh, a small building uh, has been, from my, from my past understanding, it's been pretty crowded, and I don't know what the population is over there now. But is a lot, any thought being given to replacing that structure uh, with a new <coughs> building in the area, or especially at a time, one, one of the problems we've had is trying to diversify that school. I mean, it's about 98% or 99%, I think, African-American or, or, or minority. Um, but you're getting a lot of the population, white population, moving into that area. Uh, and, and I just think it would be a good time to think about, at least start giving some thought to a new kind of building, a new kind of school there that would attract everybody. Because, you know, what happens is, over the years, people have gotten a different uh, kind of image uh, of that school as being just for minorities, the feminist thinking. And, uh, but I think this would be a good time to, to consider that. I don't know if you've given any thought to that or not. We have had some requests regarding uh, a potential uh, additional school in the downtown-ish area. Um, as you said, uh, Buena Vista is on a uh, small campus. It, I don't know the exact number of acres, but it's it's, About four acres, it's, I think. it's really small uh, compared to many other elementaries. Of course, it's a very historic building, and then we've added we added on to that building not real long ago. Uh, so part of it is fairly new. Um, we have struggled with what exactly to do there because we do have, as you said, the Germantown, Hope Garden, Salem Town area. Uh, those families clamoring for a, a school in the downtown area, yet Buena Vista sits basically underutilized. I think right. I think it's less than 70% utilized. And so uh, that's something that we need to, to work on and, and deal with. I don't know if you, uh, at one point I was suggesting that you use the Jefferson Street, lower part of Jefferson Street, because they built apartments and all down there. I don't know if that 
even available land, but uh, I, I thought that would be an ideal location, you know, because it'd be close enough to that community as well as close enough to the downtown area. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Council, Council Lady Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I was thinking on the same line of questioning about those who, um, those kids that are being gentrified out. Do you know where they are going? Um, are they going to uh, different counties? Because I know that we need for the parents to stay here and, and contribute to the economics of, of Davidson County. And I, I just thought it was interesting because while it may be only about 1% for us, that could, it could easily be 10% impact for a smaller county, which is significant for them. Um, would you happen to know that? I don't know off the top of my head, but what we'll do is we'll include that information and that data in the uh, analysis we prepare regarding the uh, the reduction, the slight reduction in enrollment, we'll try to include as much information as we have as it relates to possibly where those uh, families might be going if we know. Uh, it, I don't know that we've done to that level of detail, but obviously when student records have to be requested, they have to be requested somewhere, and so we can, we can further dig down deeper to see uh, what we can find out and include that. And I know some, I have some friends who live in Germantown and they have kids that are going to Jones per day and they were very surprised of how uh, well structured the school is and how their kids are, are learning. And I've got a couple of other questions that's probably a little lightweight. But you were talking about, I mean, I was reading here about the buses and you have to replace them. Do you know what happens to the old buses? And, and do the new buses have seat belts? I can answer both. Uh, as far as the old buses go, uh, once it's determined that they're, they've extended their useful life, uh, we declare them surplus and they are put on the EBID, the Metro Government EBID website to be sold. Okay. Uh, and EBID typically doesn't like us to, to send over more than 10 at a time because they're fairly difficult to sell and it, that tends to lower the value. And so we do have some buses that are surplus that have reached the, the end of their uh, useful life mm -hmm. according to state statute. So they're, they're surplus and then sold on the Metro government EBID site. The new buses that are being purchased do not have seat belts. Uh, that is something I know that has received a lot of attention uh, in this state as well as across the country. Uh, but we have, not, um, we have not included that at this point in purchasing new school buses. Okay, I was just wondering, what about uh, Head Start or <clears throat> other, where you have daycares that, that might want to transport kids? You know, just, just thinking about uh, some useful um, things that could be done with those school buses. And I know charter schools oftentimes will purchase those. And do you have to stay in the county in terms of selling those uh, used buses? No, you, you can take those buses anywhere you'd like, um, but charter schools would be bound by the same state law that we are as far as the age of the vehicle, so they would not be able to use those those buses either. Typically what we, what we see would be either uh, churches or, or different organizations that might want to use a bus. Usually they don't want the large 84 passenger bus, which is the majority of what we have. They want the smaller type buses, um, but we're wide open for, for anybody who might be interested. Thank you, Council Lady. Council Lady Dow. I think I hit you off. Press it again. There you go. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. I just have um, just a couple of questions. You mentioned about on the school utilization about uh, the you were getting uh, Councilman Cooper some information about the uh, portables and so forth. One other thing that I wanted to um, ask about is how the school is utilizing the space. I've been able to visit some of the schools out in our cluster and I noticed that 
some of the space that had been reserved for recreation and after school activities are now classrooms. And so they don't have that um, space that they used to have to do um, activities outside of just school. So I'll be interested to know that how many of those schools are also utilizing that, you know, common space now as classroom space. I, I know that's going on in AZ Kelly <coughs> for sure. Um, the other question I have is, and I've asked this once before, um, are you able to walk me through, like, um, or send to me what your school siting policy is and, um, and also how you all are working with the Metro Planning Department um, and, and your model and all of that? I would like to see what the process and the plan is all around that because one of the things I noticed is that we talked about some areas having an increase in enrollment. Um, of course, Antioch, we all know, is having a significant increase, an uh, overwhelming increase. And uh, I know just at the Planning Commission today, we had two different pieces of legislation. One included 256 multifamily units. Uh, at Cane Ridge, 193 single-family units. And uh, we also have two more large multifamily um, development. And I just want to, well, I, one more on Hobson Pike is 400 homes. So I want to know, I want to make sure that we have a policy and a plan that we are working together looking at um, these new construction and where these new homes and new developments are going to plan for that population. Um, historically, I have not seen that happen in the six years I've been here and even prior to that when I served on the uh, report card committee. And I think for that reason, our area of the county continues to experience a lot of overcrowdingness. And, um, so if you can share with me like the, you know, uh, the policy, the plan, how you all are working with the planning commission to predict enrollment um, and, and what the model looks like for determining enrollment. I think one of the things I talked with Mr. Prophet about in our area when addressing the capital needs for the schools is that um, we have, um, you know, apartments typically we look at in a model of having, you know, single people, you know, empty nesters and so forth. But what I'm seeing from a council perspective, people who are moving in apartments out in that southeast quarter are mostly families, sometimes with two, three, four, five kids. And I don't think that we are um, adequately modeling for uh, that population when it comes to multifamily. So um, I think we need to take that into account, and I would like to see that because I'm seeing just like I said in the last couple of weeks, uh, how much development we have coming out there. And I do predict, you know, even though we're opening up the new Eagle View School, it's going to be overcrowded because we have 600 units going in where that school is going. Um, so I would just like to see that. And last, um, about land acquisitions, because this is part of the um, capital, is that um, what, what steps are you all taking um, to, you know, I think this go back to forecasting and doing the predictive modeling, is that I noticed that when we get ready to plan for schools, a lot of times, just like with Eagle View, it's at the nth hour, uh, we're at the pleasure of the developer as far as, you know, paying what they want. And I'm just wondering, are we doing any type of um, preliminary work for land acquisition. And what I mean by that is if we had a real strong model that was working for us, then we could look at where we're seeing this growth. Like, you know, it's leaving the north, coming to the south. You know, start looking at what is the um, availability of land there. Um, potentially put some in the budget to acquire this land where you can get it um, at a lot less than you would pay when, it, when you need it, is what I'm saying, you know. So um, those are my two things that I would like to Either if you want to share some insight now, or just give me some information on it. I appreciate it. Sure. And I'll, and Council I'll lady, we're going to ask that those requests be directed uh, through through the committee so that it benefits all council members. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Mr. Henson. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do both. Uh, I'll go ahead and mention we do, our student assignment uh, office does meet regularly with the Metro Planning uh, so that we can be uh, current. Hopefully we can be current on any new developments and all of that data goes into the student enrollment projections that, uh, that are made by school, by individual school. And so we, we try to, to keep current with everything that's going on through the, the continuous conversation and discussion with Metro Planning. Uh, and it, it's difficult to, to do as far as, as you, as you said, to know, particularly with apartments, how many students it might generate. But we basically 
um, utilize the model that Metro Planning uses as it relates to number of students per apartment or number of students per house and that kind of thing. So we typically rely on, on them as it relates to that kind of, that kind of data. And so, um, but I will, I will get you, we will get you the information that you've asked. Okay, thank you. And, and like you said, you can send it through the committee. One thing I just want to say is I really think the um, MNPS and the Planning Commission need to look at your model that you're using. Um, I work in, I do predictive modeling, I'm an analyst, and I, I did my own little statistics in my area of the 43 apartment complexes. And I uh, called a lot of them and I asked about how many kids and I did my own estimation. And I can say that the planning model is not working and I think you probably know it's not working based upon the enrollment you're seeing out in our area of the um, county and you know what you're predicting and what the reality is. And so I would hope that you, know, that you all and the school board explore looking at a better model to take into account the cultural aspects, gentrification, and everything that's happening in the city uh, because what we're using now is um, it's, it's not working. I, I mean, I, I don't think it's working. I think if you drive around and look at our schools, uh, you, we know it's not working. So um, I, I would like to see that. And I'm going to start also sharing some information um, through our school board member um, with you all of what, we're, what I'm going down to planning and having approved, you know, as far as development go, because I'm not confident that um, that population of what's being approved and what's building starts and all that is being communicated. And I will uh, just touch on the other uh, piece that you mentioned. We're continuously looking for land, uh, particularly in that part of the county. We work closely with the Metro Public Properties Office in trying to identify uh, appropriate parcels of land that would be suitable for a school site. And what we've experienced over the last several years, of course it's very difficult to find, but what we've, what we've experienced is just because we include it in our six-year capital improvement budget request doesn't mean that, all, that it always gets funded in the year that we have requested. And so we, we have a number of situations where we would like to go ahead and land, uh, land bank basically some property uh, for schools because we know we're going to have to build a school or, or two or three in the future. And we just haven't received the funding to be able to go ahead and, and do that. Thank you. I, I was just going to say, you know, I agree the land bank maybe is something that, you know, we can work on as a metro council that the city holds the property because one of the things, you know, again, we're getting these big large developments and all the, the land is, is now being taken up and what's going to eventually happen if we build a school or construct a school is going to be a long way from where the, um, the housing is. And so that was one of my concerns. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Council Lady Dow. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I heard some information and wanted to get clarification. It's not located in District 6, but it is in the East Nashville area. Is there a discussion that's taken place with regard to Glenn and, or Caldwell or some of those schools with regard to a potential consolidation or move? Um, if that information is ongoing, I just wanted to be sure that I, I heard that correctly. You did. That is correct. Uh, we have been through our MNPS Next initiative. Uh, we have been looking at where we can be as efficient as possible, provide more academic opportunities for our students and families, and, and also if there's a way to either defer or eliminate some future capital costs. And so the uh, proposal that has been shared with the, the Board of Education, been shared with the school community, the, the communities themselves, and, and those meetings continue, is to consolidate the Glenn population, which is at 166 students, a very, very small school, consolidate the Glenn school with Caldwell. Uh, Caldwell, uh, they're less than a mile apart. Uh, Caldwell has the room to be able to accommodate that and to, for us to uh, be able to expand the academic offerings because the student population is at a more reasonable number and then to move the Merle program, which is a special education program, move that program from the current Merle site, which is in a very poor building uh, over in the 12th South area, move that program to the Glenn building, which is a much better building. A much, uh, it's a bigger building and a better building for that program. It's actually more centralized because that program is a countywide program, and so it's important that it be uh, centrally located. 
to move that program into the Glenn building. And so that's the proposal that's there uh, to be considered by the, the Board of Education. Uh, and again, we've had a number of community meetings as it relates to that, but that's the proposal. Okay, thank you for that information. One other thing I wanted to ask about is that we um, are having a lot of families move to East Nashville and they sometimes families wait a little bit later in life to have children than maybe they used to, but I, I do have constituents who are starting families uh, in a lot of cases who are relatively new to East Nashville. And what's been a, a, an ongoing concern that's becoming uh, a louder and louder concern is the need for um, pre-K or early childhood education and things like that. And I know Ro the Ross pre-K pre is hugely popular in East Nashville and just didn't know if there might be uh, other opportunities to expand those kind of offerings somewhere in the greater East Nashville area. And that has also been part of the discussion as it relates to um, Caldwell, uh, if, if there is space available to, even though we do have an early learning center at the Ross uh, facility, which is close, uh, we would potentially look at putting some pre-K classrooms there at Caldwell, uh, because as you said, uh, there there is the need for it, there is the desire for it. Of course, it costs, costs money. Uh, we are funding a number of our current pre-K classrooms with a federal pre-K grant, which eventually will sunset. And so at the same time, we're planning on how do we sustain those classrooms once that grant money moves away. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Chair Rosenberg. Thank you, Chair Lady. Um, just one question. When it comes to scoring, do you see... Uh, is a specific school's score pretty consistent from year to year, or can there sometimes be a wild swing? And if you do see any kind of swing, which component of the score can drive that change? Usually we see across the board fairly consistent scores over time. Where we might have a, a, a large swing could be if we have a large uh, project, for instance, if we replace the entire HVAC system or we replace the roof or some major uh, type project uh, through our deferred maintenance capital funding where we're actually improving the condition of the score, it, that can increase the score. But typically, they're fairly consistent from year to year. Thank you. I want to um, ask also, portables at, at schools, how does that factor into the, the score? The, the portables themselves don't, do not necessarily factor into the score because the score is based on the actual building. Where the portables will come in will be on the utilization of the building because if, if a school has portables, typically that means that the school is overcrowded. And so we look at two pieces when we prioritize our capital request. One would be schools that are overcrowded that have a utiliz building utilization that's over 100%, and then also looking at the facility condition score, and the lower the score, the higher the priority. Councilman Hastings. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have uh, really quick questions, uh, just two. Uh, one is about your traffic uh, control officers uh, within the area. <clears throat> uh, we had a slight issue uh, this year with the Montessori school because a lot of the, the schools that are in our area don't necessarily have those, those services anymore. And uh, right now we finally just got someone out, uh, you know, later and I knew last year we didn't have anybody at all. Um, the, the staff at the school was concerned. Also, the uh, newer neighbors that are in uh, our districts. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, have you guys address that as well uh, and to see what we can do for the safety module uh, because traffic, as you see, the city is growing and uh, which we all know, and it's getting somewhat out of control. And the more and more homes that we have within that area uh, cause a, a lot of backup. So we need to make sure that we have uh, adequate amount of uh, traffic uh, control in that area. Yep. Uh, Councilman, are you referring to uh, crossing guards? Yes. yes, yes. Crossing guards are employees of the police department. Uh, we don't, school district does not employ and we don't distribute where 
crossing guards go. We do make requests, uh, but the police department <coughs> basically makes the determination of, of where crossing guards are located and how many there are. Uh, but but we, we help with that. If we know that there's an issue, we, we make those requests uh, through our security department onto the Metro Police Department. So if, if you if you wanted to, to give us some specifics, we'll be happy to pass that on as well. Well, thank you very much with that. Uh, I will definitely use that information that we have. Thank you, Ken. Also, oh. also just, just one more, one more, one more. <laughs> uh, I know a lot of talk is about portables. Uh, we just had a discussion about the homeless here in the city. I don't know, and I wasn't, wasn't uh, here exactly when you guys were talking about that. I don't know if you guys have vacant portables or assistant older portables that can be used <clears throat> with the help of getting our homeless population outside of the the coal and sometimes in, in drastic heat that we have here in the city. I know that there are, there are some schools, uh, old schools now that are uh, Jerry Baxter, the old Jerry Baxter School is now being uh, used as a community uh, a location so that we, well, not Jerry, but John Early is being used as a community location so that we could find resources to put some of our homeless people into places that they're, where they're warm. And because we run the, the power and, and the system to warm and cool those buildings, and just the putting that out there and not necessarily saying that we're gonna do something right away, but just looking at avenues that how we can uh, meet that need as well. So. Sure, and, and we just like school buses, we do have a surplus of portables. Uh, we follow the same process as school buses where they are declared surplus and then uh, they are put on the EBID site to sell. Part of what we run into is the cost of actually moving the portables. It's very expensive. Um, but we would be happy to, to work with anyone that might want to use some of our excess portables for that purpose. Uh, I think you're, as you said, I think you're referring to the old John Early, which we call the Magruder Center. Yeah. Uh, they do provide a lot of, serve many services uh, to our community. We're happy to work with, with anybody that might be able to use any of our excess portables with the realization that there is a, a cost, a fairly substantial cost, sometimes in the neighborhood of $20,000 each to move a portable, get it set back up, get it connected to utilities. So there is a cost, but we're happy to work with anyone because we do have excess. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Chair Vircher. Uh, my first question is related somewhat to um, the line of questions from Council Lady Dowell um, related to uh, school siting. And I wondered if you could remind us, um, I believe there is a state statute as to the size of land on which a middle school and a high school have to be sited. Um, can you remind us of that? And I apologize, I did uh, arrive late, so if, if anything's repetitive, please feel free to get that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I would probably want to refer to, to someone else on that. I, I'm not positive that that state statute still exists as it relates to the size uh, that fell under the old, what are called rules and regulations, and many of those were eliminated uh, to give school districts more flexibility. Uh, we do have our own internal um, process that we use in determining the size of, of a campus. Uh, for instance, typically uh, 10 to 15 acres for an elementary school, uh, but, it, but it needs to be uh, you know, fairly flat as far as the to topography goes. It can't be sloping. And so uh, we have different uh, sizes that we use internally when we begin to look for properties for elementary, middle, and high schools. But we can look into that and, and make sure what I'm saying is correct. Uh, as it relates to any state statute. Okay, well, can you just share what you use internally then, 10 to 15 for elementary? And I'm afraid I'm gonna misspeak, so if it's okay. Can if Mr. Prophet speak to that? Uh, he possibly can, or we can provide it to you. Uh, David, you wanna like go ahead and get- I'd like to speak to it now, please. Why don't you go come ahead to the David Prophet, Director of Planning and Facilities, Metro Schools. Um, as Chris indicated, it's 10 to 15 acres for an elementary school. It is roughly 20 to 24 acres, I believe it is, for middle school, 
and then it can vary depending on the high school and the programmatic needs of the high school, um, uh, 30 to 35 acres minimally. And to your knowledge, we, we are not under any state statute as To my knowledge, to we are not. However, my understanding is, based on what my predecessor told me, is that those limits and all of the other uh, requirements for site selection um, still go hand in hand with what they had in the uh, state statutes. Okay. Whether it's in effect now or not, I'll, that I do have to, to go back and look at. And so have you all considered revising those? I mean, I guess as you step up to middle school and high school, obviously you have sports related programming, your populations grow. Um, but you know, to Council Lady Dow's point, you know, historically we went out to our periphery, we built these major, huge comprehensive high schools because land was cheap and we had the acreage and so forth. But as we um, intensify from a development perspective, I wonder if you all are kind of looking forward to a more urban model of school. Um, you know, so you have a school like a, a, a Hume Fogg, um, which, you know, it's kind of at the, at the top of our uh, 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 schools with no, uh, you know, in an urban footprint um, with no playing fields, but, you know, looking to kind of consolidate maybe where some sports activities happen, you know, in floodplain that we are potentially acquiring and then schools share that. I mean, I, I know that certainly for families having everything on one site is, is an ideal, um, but I think from a planning perspective as we look forward, um, just kind of architecturally, urban design wise, we, we may want to start kind of evolving to a more urban model of school. And uh, I know we had that conversation in Green Hills somewhat, you know, kind of looking at you know, what were people's comfort level? There was an initial very urban um, style proposed. The community didn't like that as much, and, you know, we got, got to where we got. But I wonder if you can kind of speak to the discussions you're having um, in that regard, because from a capital planning perspective, you know, more urban schools that are smaller versus less schools that are larger at the perimeter and all those factors. Can you speak to that in just a general sense? I can. Uh, we have had those discussions, and it, it really, a lot of it depends upon the location. If we're in a much more dense area, then yes, we would be looking at uh, at a footprint that could be smaller. Of course, as you mentioned, uh, teachers, students, and families, they all want green space. Uh, when you get into the high schools, of course, you have to take into consideration students driving and student parking. Uh, as you said, with all of the athletic field, all the different sports, practice fields, etc., uh, but when we start looking, uh, particularly in more dense areas, that is something that we've considered. And, and as you probably know, we do have schools that, as you said, we do have schools that, that fall under uh, what we typically look for uh, in the number of acres uh, as it relates to the tier, elementary, middle, or high school. But a lot of times it's going to, to depend upon where the location is of the school uh, that you know, that's probably going to play a big part in determining what kind of design, as far as an urban type of design, what kind of design we might be looking for as it relates to the land availability. And I appreciate that. And I guess what I'm asking, you know, if you always operate from the assumption that all the high school kids are going to drive to your school, right, that, that drives a certain, or, or that a certain number, but, you know, from a locational standpoint, factoring in transit and so forth, uh, you know, maybe can reduce the amount of parking that you have to provide. Um, and then I guess my other question uh, was related to um, school siding and speed limits around schools being on major uh, collectors, major streets, and so forth. I know you have school zone uh, speed limits that you set during kind of school hours or, or turn those on. Uh, but uh, can you speak to that as far as uh, the walkable infrastructure um, that you're hoping to provide and what your kind of priorities are there related to the, the street? And then additionally, can you speak to your bus priority area? Um, I hear a lot of people saying that, uh, you know, the bus won't pick us up because we're within a mile of the school, but it's not safe for us to walk to the school and thus all the parents drive the kids to the school, and then this creates traffic problems, et cetera. So I wonder if you've also looked um, from a walkability perspective uh, what you might 
do. And additionally, from the bus perspective, if you could maybe change that radius a little bit to pick up more kids. Sure. Uh, in, in addition to the, the Metro Planning Department and the Metro Public Properties Office, we, we do work uh, and meet regularly with MTA, meet regularly with Public Works as it relates to public transportation, as it relates to sidewalks and walkability. Uh, we, we aspire to that. Um, as far as the, the radius goes, uh, the, the state only funds transportation for the school district in a radius of one, uh, 1.25 miles or further uh, from the school. Uh, and that's for elementaries, for, high, for middle and high schools, it's uh, 1.5 miles or further. Uh, we do not necessarily adhere to that in all, all cases. Uh, uh, based on exactly what you were saying, there are some areas where it may not be safe uh, for students to walk. They may have to cross a major thoroughfare or even an interstate uh, to be able to, in an urban setting like we have, to be able to get to school. And so uh, we make exceptions a lot as it relates to that radius based upon the safety, based upon um, you know what the surrounding area is. And you, you do bring up a good point that we do take into consideration as it relates to the number of cars that, uh, that drop students off as opposed to reducing the radius and allowing bus transportation to, allevi to alleviate crowding. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have done that in some cases, uh, I believe in, uh, in your, your area and Councilman Pulley's area with Julia Green Elementary, for instance, we've done it there because of the number of car riders, the number of uh, parents that want to drive their students or do not want their students to, to walk, and so they'll drive them. So we've added some bus routes, and that's one area, but there are plenty of others where we've done that as well as it relates to that for that reason or, for, again, for the safety where there's not sidewalks, where it's not safe for students to be able to walk to school. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Lady. Council Lady uh, Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, although I'm not neither committee, but I just have a little bit of a question. Uh, I would like to start with uh, capital improvement budget in general and some specific in my district as well. Uh, in capital improvement budget, I know you're going to be uh, getting busy and start talking priority and so forth. But uh, this budget year, 2017-18 uh, budget year, uh, you are approved capital uh, capital budget request was uh, $278 million, but what uh, we were able to allocate was uh, $85 million. So it's uh, quite, you know, underfunded for uh, uh, FY 27, 28, and your budget on adopted budget for FY 1920 uh, is uh, 380 million. So you know this year you have 183 million dollar unfunded, hopeful capital improvement uh, you know budget, and then next year uh, your plan was 380. Million, so it would be 563 million for as far as capital improvement budget is concerned. And so, how are you planning to uh, consolidate, you know, those dilemma? Because you know everybody knows we won't be able to fund a 583 million dollar for next, uh, you know, budget year. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate it. Uh, one. Uh, revision, this current year's capital uh, budget, capital spending plan that was approved for schools was $82 million uh, in the end. That $3 million was transferred to Metro Public Works for sidewalks around schools. So our actual uh, capital uh, budget for this current fiscal year is $82 million. Uh, the process that we use uh, through our capital needs committee and our discussions is anything that was included in year one of that six-year capital improvement budget request that was not funded through the capital spending plan typically moves up to a priority, of course, uh, for the next request. And so what we typically do is we will reevaluate all of those projects to make sure they're still top priority, uh, look at any new projects that might be top priority, 
and reprioritize based upon what has been funded as compared to and as opposed to what had been requested. And so uh, we feel it, that it's important to, to let people know what our needs are. Uh, and so that's why we include the number that we do in our six-year capital improvement budget. Uh, and we feel like we can um, substantiate that number, realizing, as you said, that there's, uh, you know, there are capacity issues we understand as it relates to how much capital funding can be approved. And so we're thankful and appreciative for what we do receive. And we will begin looking at the next year, looking at those items that did not make it into the capital spending plan uh, and hopefully uh, receive funding for those in the next round. Thank you. Uh, so the next one is my district specific. Uh, for that, because uh, I do have three schools. One is elementary school, you know, Westmead Elementary School has been over capacity and has been on uh, your plan for the capital improvement request, but because of those uh, budgetary issue, it was never be able to placed on the top priority list. So, so next uh, budget cycle, maybe would that be a chance to be able to eliminate portable and going into actual renovation and rebuild uh, the new plan? That will, of course, be part of the discussion that we'll have through our Capital Needs Committee discussions. Uh, I will mention briefly, this specifically as it relates to Westmead, we have seen an actual enrollment, slight enrollment decrease there. Uh, and so we don't have quite the overcrowding as we did have, but it's still overcrowded. And it would still obviously remain uh, a major part of our discussion as we begin looking at what we plan to propose for 2018-19. Thank you. So my next specific question is in regards to Hillwood High School, because we have uh, allocated funding to purchase a new high school location, and also the designing uh, budget was allocated prior year. So I am uh, assuming uh, the design processes are going, and I'm assuming uh, probably next budget cycle, you will ask for the construction uh, funding for that new location. So how is the designing process is going? Uh, my understanding is the design process is going well. We have purchased the property. Uh, and as you said, we, uh, and again, it'll ultimately be up to the Board of Education, but we uh, plan to propose the construction costs for the new high school in the, uh, in the capital <coughs> improvement budget that would be submitted. Uh, if you want some details as it relates to where we are exactly in the design process, Mr. Prophet can provide that to you if you'd like that. Yeah, certainly, that'd be great. And my last question is, so when uh, uh, designs are done. Council Lady uh, Johnson, let uh, Mr. Prophet answer your, your last question oh, sure. before you move on. Thank you. Okay, well, you could have finished. Um, we have uh, selected an architect, of course, <clears throat> Hastings Architecture. And they, we've gone through a programmatic um, exercise to determine what goes in the school. We work very closely with Dr. Chauncey and, and uh, other staff of MMPS to make sure that we've got the right uh, spaces uh, for the building. We're going through an exercise now to look at the actual modeling of that school, and we've got two or three potential um, directions to go in that design. Um, eventually, our goal is to come up with a more refined design and share that then with the community. Obviously, you would be you know, on that invite list. Um, so that that's where we are. We're we're looking toward. I think it's the end of December, Tracy. End of end of December, we should be able to um, look at a schematic design, and um, we're getting really close. It's really exciting. I mean, the, the process uh, is is kind of fun. It's the fun part of the job. So okay. Thank you. So now moving on to my last question and comment. So. I'm great, uh, very excited those processes going, and I'm sure it's a fun process, and looking forward to be able to see a new design and so forth. And I'm sure our community, especially Bellevue community, is really excited as well. And so when uh, construction is done, uh, the existing building uh, currently used uh, as a Hillwood High School will be vacated. Do you have any plan for the future building or any conversation has started? We have not. We've had some informal conversations earlier as it relates to potentially uh, looking at, par at a park for the area. 
Um, but we still have a number of years to go before the new high school is actually built. Uh, so we haven't, uh, we haven't really begun those formal discussions at this point, but we're, we're open to input, uh, to receiving input on that. Um, at this point, we're planning for it to remain metro property uh, in some form, whether it be a, a park or, or something else. So we're, n we're not looking to do anything uh, with that that would um, put that building in the private sector. Well, thank you. That's great to hear because that is uh, our community plans calls for. You know, of course, uh, if school moves, uh, community would like to have some kind of a school, but you know, realistically, population and student body will not support immediate, you know, other type of school. So what we are envisioning is keep that uh, property as public hand. So we, uh, you know, as a community, uh, very lack of park space. So if we can have park utilizing existing athletic field and tennis court and so forth. And also we do have a great uh, library inside of the building. So if we can keep that as a you know, library, park, and then have some kind of community gathering space. So we do have a great idea. And if you want to check out uh, keephillwoodgreen.com, and we do have a park library athletic field uh, idea. And when, you know, years from now, 15 years, 25 years, however the long, if we can keep it as a metro property, uh, when you need to convert back to the school, that would be much economically uh, advantage. So I would like you to think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman Cooper. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. A quick question. Um, while you all are here, in terms of a policy question for the board, um, we recently approved the sale of the school on Dickerson Road to a charter school. Um, and the explanation was it was required to be sold to them because otherwise they could not make the capital improvements to the building. Uh, without that they they didn't have an appropriate lease that would allow for capital investment and so ultimately the building was sold um, the school board's policy for leasing to charter schools is what is the length of that lease yeah and just a couple of corrections the the Please. school the Thank school you. is on Knight Road oh okay. uh, the Ewing Park school building uh, is what you're speaking about um, that building has been leased by KIPP for a number of years. Um, but on a year-to-year -year or two-year-to-two-year -year basis? Uh, we have, we allow for an annual lease. We also allow for a longer-term lease. We have some five-year leases. Um, and, and we've even considered some longer-term leases. Uh, in those longer-term leases, up to 10 years, what we've allowed is uh, what we call rent credit for approved capital construction at okay. the building. And so it allows our charters, if they want to go ahead and to, to do something that we would consider to be approved capital funding that would enhance our building, uh, then we would consider rent credit for that, uh, where they would not obviously have their rent uh, reduced by the amount of the approved capital. And so uh, we have a number of leases of different links depending upon what the charter actually needs, what the school district is willing to provide up to 10 years. So we have some, some annual leases, but we've, we've gone more toward longer term leases with many of our charters. And that particular building, we worked closely with our student assignment department to determine whether or not we feel short term or long term if there would ever be a need for the school district to utilize that building based upon its location as a school and the answer was no we're not going to have a need for that um, it wasn't something that um, that we were required or that uh, that the charter school was required to do as far as the purchase we just felt like at their request at some point there was going to need to be some some capital put into that building and as the lessor, that would be MNPS, that would be our responsibility to do that because it's our building. 
and they had a need and wanted to stay there for a, a long period of time because they are opening an elementary school, have opened an elementary school, and they wanted that particular building to be a kin kindergarten through eighth grade building, and they needed to add space to be able to make that uh, a reality. We, we could have disagreed with that and said, no, you need to figure something else out, but we felt like it was something uh, where we didn't necessarily need the building. Uh, we don't need a school in that particular area. They were a willing buyer, and you don't find too many willing buyers of a school building. And so we had the building and property appraised uh, through Metro Public Properties, and uh, we were able to, to sell that and to utilize those funds for the backlog of deferred maintenance that we do have, uh, that, uh, that we have plenty of needs for. But the 10-year lease, I mean, you, in this situation, you all were shrinking your footprint in that area anyway. Uh, it, in other areas, the 10-year lease is available to charter schools, and you, they do get rent credit for capital improvements that they make to their building? It's up to the district. Uh, we determine, we'll determine what that term would be. So if it's in an area where we think we might need a facility, for instance, then we would look at a much shorter term okay. on that. So it really depends upon where it's located, what the condition of the building is, et cetera. So we take them on a case-by-case -case basis. How many charter schools, since all of them are under your umbrella, uh, where um, the government you may not know the answer to this, where the government is the landlord but not the school board. So you, do you see my question, that, that some entity of metro government is the landlord? For example, General Services, I believe, is in one of them. Uh, are you aware of how many schools that that exists for? I'm not. I do. I do know the Kip High School at the High, the former Highland Heights right. building. Uh, is Met, Metro government owns that building now, and I believe leases that okay. building to Kip High School. But I'm not sure how many others. That's there the might only be. one that you're aware of. There was a former uh, Head Start site, I believe. Uh, Councilman Withers can correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong, but I believe there was a former Head Start site uh, that is now owned by Metro government and. Leasing to a charter school, is that correct? I believe that might be the only one. just for the record, but uh, the, um, the building at 1310 Ordway Place in Lachlan Springs was the historic Ross School building, had been a Head Start Center. The prior council uh, member and the council approved a 10-year lease of that uh, facility to Nashville Classical Charter School, as well as there is a building at uh, the corner of 10th and Fatherland in the Five Points area that I may also have been a Head Start or something like that at one point in time that has been sort of, um, I don't know if that's the official title, but uh, an incubator center uh, there for charter schools and is currently occupied by Explore School. Those, those are two that I know of in District 6. Explore School, that, that would be a third or, or conceivably a fourth. Well, viewing that as a governmental entity that is not the school board. Yeah. Okay. Super. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Um, we have a few more council members in the queue before we wrap up our, our community uh, committee meeting. The Councilman Hastings is gone. Councilman Kendall, will you seek an additional recognition? We have some trouble with the, the queue up here. There they are. <laughs> I'm a clear um, you out, Council Lady Dow.
Councilman Kendall. Yes, a uh, couple, of, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, one, on the deferred maintenance that you're talking about, the 300 and some odd million dollars, does that come out of the capital budget that you asked for, or is that additional funds? It's, it's a part of our six-year capital improvement budget request, uh, and we break it down over the six years. In total, uh, it, it does total uh, over $300 million in identified deferred maintenance, which basically, it's not, it's not your typical operating maintenance where you something that you would do on an annual basis. Right. It's, it's usually major type projects that have been deferred where you have systems that have exceeded their useful life. And so you continue to, to attempt to maintain, uh, but they really need to be replaced. This, this question here is related to, somewhat related to capital uh, budget. Uh, and I'm thinking about minority participation in the contracts and et cetera with the school board. I know. When I was a member of the board, uh, it was a little different now. I don't know. I guess Metro, does Metro handle all of your your contractual work now, or do you do that within the system? No, we still do that within the system. Okay. And we, we have a consultant, uh, Gwen Sims Davis, that we continue to use right. uh, as our minority diverse uh, diversity business enterprise consultant. Uh, and so what she does for us is she helps us identify potential minority uh, firms as well as making sure that those minority firms understand uh, what the requirements are to do business with metro schools and metro government and to get them registered uh, to make sure they're aware of any bids that are out there or requests for proposals. Uh, so we, we attempt the best we can working through our consultant to increase the, uh, the, div the diversity of our contractors and, and the use of minority firms. In, in the definition of mi minority, what does that include? I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get all of them. I, I know that it's uh, women-owned facility, uh, women-owned firms, uh, minority firms, as well as small businesses. There may be something else included in there, but I know those three are included. Well, one of the discussions that we're having here at the council is uh, the lack of diversity, especially as it relates to African American contractors and companies in Nashville. I think in the last couple of years or so, we've been looking at percentages of one or two percent participation in our especially construction project uh, around the city that a uh, government uh, funded uh, that we participate in at least and how successful do you think you are being I know at one point the school system had better than 10 percent participation this was way way back uh, how successful are you now especially with African-American companies now and I'm not limiting this just to construction you know, you all, you guys buy, you do printing, you do paper, you do toilet tissue. You know, I mean, you you do you buy a lot of things. Uh, how 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 is that going? Do are, are we finding uh, African American companies, uh, especially those locally, that are participating in the process? And if so, why don't you believe that's true? Or do you have any? feeling about that? Well, obviously we can always improve. Uh, we do include in our bids, uh, there is a component to the bid scoring as it relates to minority women or small business firms, uh, that if, if it qualify, if that firm qualifies for one of those categories, there's additional points awarded uh, for bids and proposals. Uh, as you indicated, there there are times when it's, it's difficult to find minority firms, particularly who are able to they have the capacity to be able to provide the goods and services to an organization as large as the school district. Uh, what we attempt also to do is to encourage our contractors to utilize minority subcontractors, and that's a part of the bid process uh, that we use is for our prime contractors to identify potential minority subcontractors uh, that they could use on the project. But as I say, we, we can always do better. I don't have the, the numbers off the top of my head of, of, of how we're doing, and it, it varies over time. Uh, but we can look at it on an annual basis uh, well, to see where we stand. Well, I know you have to be concerned with costs, but I recall back before we had the uh, contracted out the janitorial services, uh, we did them ourselves within the system. And at one point, they were we had that uh, stipulation in there as related to minority participation. Uh, what happened was we were bidding them on the uh, at 10 at a time, 10 schools. 
and that a lot of the minority companies did not have the capacity, especially African American minority companies, did not have the financial capacity to take on that many projects. So what the Board of Education did at that time, we broke it down to three. Uh, you could you could bid on three projects. So I'm just encouraging you to look at some innovative ways because when you when it comes to bonding and those kind of things, yes, there are a lot of limitations with uh, with a lot of these companies. But if you could look at ways that, that innovative ways or creative ways that we can encourage and engage, because I, I talk to a lot of minority businesses and they won't even make a bid with the government, not just the, the school board, because they don't feel they have a chance. And so they don't, they don't get engaged. So maybe from that end, we can, we can think about, because I know we're trying to do that from this end up here, I hope, uh, to, to change it. Because we want Nashville, and I, I'm gonna keep saying this to the day I die, I guess, we want Nashville to be an it city for everybody. Thank you. And, and I will follow up uh, just briefly on, on that, Mr. Kendall. Um, we have been successful in utilizing uh, minority architectural firms on some of our smaller projects, Melvin Gill and Associates, for instance. Uh, we've used uh, that firm on, for instance, when we have a, a classroom addition project or partnering, uh, actually partnering uh, on major projects like Stratford. Um, when you uh, you did mention the outsourcing of the custodial services, that has been a success as it relates to this process. Uh, initially, we required uh, the contractor to utilize 10% of minority firms uh, in as a subcontractor. When we renewed that contract, we increased that to 20%. And so uh, that contractor is currently at the 20% level, uh, utilizing minority firms for both uh, cleaning services at certain schools, smaller number of schools, as well as purchasing custodial supplies from minority-owned businesses. And so that that contract does have that 20% stipulation in it, and it's being met. Any more questions, Councilman? No, I just want to uh, thank you for the information. And I was the one on the board at that time who asked for the 10%. And I think they had two custodial companies, and I hope they're still... A part of uh, a, a part of that process. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady Hurt. Thank you, Madam Chair. In relationship to those um, contracts with those three businesses, the um, what's the percentage? It does it show that you have them as participants, but what's the percentage of the contracts are they actually getting? Because, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to show that you have the participation, but then if they're only getting 1% of the contract, that's another, it's not quite the 20% participation. Right. The stipulation in the contract is that the contractor will subcontract with minority firms for 20% of the total contract price. So mm -hmm. it's 20% of the total dollars in the contract. So do you, is it, is it somewhere that is recorded in terms of whether, if that money is actually being distributed? Yes, it's required to be uh, documented by the contractor and the subcontractors on a monthly basis. And so that's something that we monitor on a monthly basis to be sure that that 20% is being met. Is it possible for me to see that? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Council Lady. Seeing no other council members um, in the queue. Oh, yeah, do you have someone? Yeah, well, I'll just um, thank you all very much for being here. Our wonderful school board members, Dr. Joseph, uh, Mr. Henson, and, and the rest of the team, thank you for coming. Um, we're working on setting up a couple more informational sessions moving forward ahead of budget. Um, tonight, of course, was capital budget and facilities, and we're working on a couple more topics um, farther down the line so that we can uh, stay engaged. Keep the line of, yes, mm -hmm. keep the lines of communication open. Thank you all. And um, also those requests, Mr. North, if you can uh, provide those answers back to the committee uh, so we can have those uh, uh, questions and answers uh, communicated to, to the entire uh, council body. Thank you so much. Thank the committee members. Again, thank you, Mr. Joseph, Dr. Joseph, uh, Chris, Anna, uh, uh, wonderful District 6 school board member representing Southeast, Ms. Hunter, 
and this adjourns our joint meeting. Thank you so much. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.